And you're listening to the Landmark Hour, originating in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the Landmark Baptist Temple, the Pastor John Rowling speaking. Thank and be seated. Our Landmark Choir singing a shelter in the time of storm.
open your Bibles, please, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. I'm speaking today on the subject of prayer. When you pray, the Bible tells us how to pray. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. This is what is commonly called the model prayer. You will find it recorded also in Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. In chapter 6, Matthew's been talking to the hearts of the disciples here, or Jesus has through Matthew, the writings of Matthew. And he says in verse 7, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Now, there are three things that I want to emphasize in this message today. And the first thought is revealed in verse 8. The reference to your Father. Your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask Him. Now, to have a right relationship with God in prayer, it must be based upon sonship. Let's talk a little bit about the family. I'd like to bring greetings to my two sisters who listen to my broadcast regularly when they're not in church. They live several hundred miles away it's been a number of years since we saw each other last. But once in a while, they do have the opportunity of listening to their only brother preach the gospel. And I'm sure that I have their prayers every week and every Sunday. It's a great encouragement to me. It means a lot to me to know that my own flesh and blood remember me in prayer. My son that left just this afternoon, driving back down to Louisville to the university there, he said, Dad, I'll be listening to you tonight. I'll hear the broadcast, the Lord willing. Let's talk about the family, your family. Would you like to do that? Does it mean anything to you, your family? Did you read the newspaper the other day? Uh, forget which one of our Cincinnati papers had an article in it about uh, the mass murders that we have had uh, how that uh, father killed a whole family of children. Uh, they are sure that it was uh, that he uh, that it was murder, self suicide, and then uh, within the family, a brother killed a sister, and uh, then the daughter killed a mother. And I don't know how many references. You read that. This is a violent age we live in, isn't it? Family ties they don't mean much anymore. It seems. Now let me ask you something. Uh, if you have any intelligence whatsoever, you know that family ties are bound by certain limitations. If you are a member of a certain family, you, you had to get into that family by birth or by adoption. One of the two. Now, isn't that so? The common, natural means is to get into that family by birth, a physical birth. Now, doesn't it stand to reason if Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8 means anything, if God is our Father, then He becomes our Father by our birth. Not by creation, but by regeneration. You see, this is contradictory to the religious philosophy of our age. Haven't you heard, haven't you heard uh, religious leaders talk about all men being sons of God? And a lot of you poor, naive people believe that. God have mercy on your poor, ignorant soul. Why don't you think for yourself? You say, well, I heard somebody say that. Do you believe everything you hear? Suppose somebody says that all men are children of God. Does that make it so? Positively not. Did you read in your paper today where the theologian from Germany the right Reverend Dr. Paul Tillich said that uh, hell is a myth. Does that make hell a myth? Not in 10,000 worlds it doesn't. Just because some uh, Bible rejecter doesn't believe something doesn't make it so. Why in Psalm 14, 1 it said, the fool said in his heart there is no God. If God lied about hell, then he's a liar all the way and we can't believe anything. 
Why try to put words in God's mouth? Why not be consistent? If I had been a preacher, I wanted to be a lawyer. I'd like to have been a lawyer. I think that's a challenging vocation to be a lawyer, to be on the, in, the, in the courtroom and to plead a case. To me, it'll afford it a challenge. Well, any lawyer, any judge will tell you that if you're going to present your case before a jury and so forth, that you need to get all of the evidence, all right? You ought to, you ought to have gumption enough to use your own head and not take what somebody else said. Why not read the Bible? The Bible talks about another family. In John 8, 44, Jesus himself said to a crowd of religious people, said, you're of your father the devil. You say, well, he didn't mean that. Well, why didn't he say what he meant if he didn't mean what he says? He really got us mixed up. If Jesus Christ doesn't have the ability to speak in a fluent way and in a definite way so that we can understand what he meant, then I'm not going to be accountable. But Jesus Christ did say what he meant to say. And he said, you're of your father the devil to that crowd of unbelievers. And there's two families in the world today and don't let anybody kid you, you better study your Bible. Now my text said, for your father knoweth what things you have need of. God the Father. Now let me ask you, when you stand up or when you stand to recite the Apostles' Creed and you call God Father and you haven't been saved, you can drink like a fish and get drunk on Saturday night and go to church with all of your pious platitudes on Sunday morning and repeat the Apostles' Creed and call God Father. Isn't that a joke? Man, that's a joke to me. How can God be your Father and you live in the hog pen? You can't. When you're born again, when you're redeemed by blood, you become a new creature in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, all right, to pray and to pray sensibly and to pray scripturally and to pray like you should pray and call God Father means that you must first be born again. You must be born of the Spirit of God. You must be born again, Jesus said. Now look, in John chapter three and in verse three, he says you'll not get inside of the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And in verse five, he said you must be born of the water and of the spirit to enter the kingdom of God. And in verse seven, he says, marvel not that I said to you, you must be born again. And in James 1, 15, he says we're begotten or born again by the word of truth. First Peter 1, 23, and I could go and give you other references. Why don't you believe God's word? Have you been born again? Can you look back yonder in the past and say at a certain time, I was born again, that I passed out of death into life, I repented of my sins, and, and I forsook my sins, and I've obtained mercy. Has it happened to you? You're not going to heaven if you haven't had the new birth. That's what the Bible said. Now the Lord said in Matthew 7, he said, many shall come in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have not we done many wonderful works in your name? We built hospitals. We've been philanthropic in all of our activities, and we belong to various benevolent organizations, and the Lord says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Not every man that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. You have to belong to the family. Do you belong to the family? Can you look back yonder and say, at the age of 14, I was saved? Can you say, Preacher Rawlings, it happened over in Germany. I was a paratrooper, and when I dropped down, I was behind enemy lines, and it seemed that after all communication was cut off that it, it was inevitable death. And there in that foxhole that day, I bowed my head in the dirt and I said, oh God, save my soul. I'm not prepared to die. And you got saved. Is that right? When did it happen to you? Have you been born again? Do you really know? You say, now, Preacher Rawlings, that's why I don't like to hear you preach. You're too dogmatic. It isn't John Rawlings at all. That's what the Bible says. You know what the Bible said about some preachers? Said in the last days, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears that have turned away from the truth and have turned unto fables. Mr. Tillich that tries to rule hell out of the Bible, he's turned unto fables. And that's exactly what men want to hear. They don't want to hear about hell and about judgment and about dying. Let me tell you a little story. 
lying over here in one of the hospitals tonight is a young boy that's a double amputee. Both lower limbs have been amputated. I stood by his bedside just three days ago and I talked to him about Jesus. I said, young man, have you been thinking about being saved? He said, I have. I said, do you want to be? He said, I do. And there with the Holy Word of God, a little Gideon New Testament, I appointed him to Jesus Christ who died in his place and in his stead. That young man was in a horrible car accident. Tonight he lives in Jesus Christ because he received him as his Savior. A young lady from another city came to his room and with her Bible, she was going to witness to him and he told her that Reverend Rawlings had been to his room and he had accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Please don't laugh that off. That's a reality, my friends. There's a man sitting in this auditorium tonight and he was in my office and I led him to Christ and he said, Reverend Rawlings, for years I've gone from bar to bar and I've lived in sin and I've drunk the cup to the bitter dregs, but he said after the day was over, he said, there was always an emptiness in my soul. That's what sin does for you. You see, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about the wine that sparkles in the glass, and it said at the end, it stingeth like an adder and it bites like a serpent. That's what liquor will do for you, son. It'll never bring lasting joy and peace. That's sin. I'm trying to tell you that this business of religion is real, Mr. Sinner Man. There's a reality in it. I could ask a hundred people in this audience tonight if you've tried the whiskey bottle and it didn't satisfy, the people would stand. You know, let me tell you another story. Years ago down in Smith County, Texas, I was pastoring in Tyler, called the oil capital of Texas. The, the county was dry. And so the liquor crowd decided that they would put on an option election and they'd bring liquor back. Well, the, the fight was hot and heavy. And I was in the midst of it. And of course, on radio once and twice a day and advertising a newspaper and our church is so large, it, it really dominated the religious life of the city. And so the liquor crowd, they started a rumor that the bootleggers had paid John Rawlings off that they gave me $50,000 so that we could keep the county dry and the bootleggers would have a field day. Now that's, that's how crooked that crowd is. Well, I got on the radio and I said there was just one thing not wrong with it, it wasn't so. If they want to give me $50,000, I could go on several radio stations, you see, and make, put their whiskey money to work. Well, with the, the, crowd, the, the thing was really hot. I went to my radio man. He built about 14 radio stations in the Southwest, graduate of Harvard University, or rather Yale University, with high honors. And he and I had become good friends. He was like a father to me. Incidentally, he wasn't a Baptist. Every once in a while, he's retired now. He picks the phone up and calls me and talks with me. I hope he's listening tonight. Anyway, I told him, I said, Sunday night, I want you to leave the radio line open and let me stay on until I finish. He said, okay, that'll be all right. Well, the liquor crowd didn't know what I was going to do. I had an open air service. We had hundreds of people there. And I had lined up some of my own men and women that would come to the microphone and testify of what whiskey had done for them. Well, that liquor crowd didn't know that. I was going to lick the tar out of him. When you're in a fight, don't ever let your enemy know what you're going to do. Shoot him behind. That's, the way, that's my policy. <laughs> if I'm going to have a fight, you think I'm going to shoot a man, uh, uh, treat him fair? Not in your life. No, sirree. You say, well, that's not the way to fight. Well, I just don't want anybody fighting me. I'm going to try to treat every man right. But if I can get him dirty, I'll get him dirty. And I was going to get that liquor crowd behind and in front and on either side and after dark and before daylight. I despise that crowd that traffics in the souls of men. And so I had these folks ready to, to testify. Had the choir to sing a couple of old numbers that stared the folks' hearts. And then I said, I'm going to call for volunteers to come and testify. And there was a tall, attractive young woman that came to the microphone and said, Pastor Rawlings, I won't testify. And she started testifying. She stood there with her face shining and told how that from bar to bar, 
over in Kilgore, Texas and different places that she had thrown her life and her virtue and her health away and she had tried to commit suicide. Ms. Rawlings and another lady had gone to the home and had ministered to her and finally won her to Christ and I baptized her and she was active in our church and she stood before that crowd and told what sin had done and how that she had on her body scars where she tried to take her own life and it wasn't one of these Hollywood kind. She had really tried to kill herself. And then I had men to come and testify, and one after another. And we had some, uh, a number of oil people, and, and some millionaires were sitting right down in the amen corner. And a couple of fellows whom I knew quite well, and there was a, girl, a lady in that audience that they used to run around with. They had their wives with them. And this, this lady was there, she had been saved, and baptized in our church. And she came to the platform and testified and said, some of you that's sitting here, I danced with you and I ran around with you and my life was a wreck. And she said, when Pastor Rawlings preached one Sunday morning and gave the date, she said, I ran from the building screaming and they caught me and carried me back to the altar. And I cried out, oh God, save my soul. And said, I've been sober every day since. I have a class of little girls since she went ahead and related what God had done for her. And brother, listen, you talk about pandemonium breaking loose. Finally, they had to cut my, my program off. I'd already gone over about 20 minutes. And the cars of that city, there were so many. And that four lane road in front of my church was blocked and all of the side streets, you, uh, traffic was blocked for, I don't know how far people wanted to see what was taking place. Hearing those testimonies of people that's now sober that were once drunkards, both men and women. Some of the men were drunkards at the age of 16 years. Don't try to kid John Rawlings, I know what the grace of God will do. I won rich people and poor people, educated and uneducated people. Don't try to kid me at all. I know what I'm talking about. There's 50, 75 school teachers, college professors, members of this church. Let me tell you something. Don't sit back there and try to kid me and tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. I know the transforming grace of God in a sinner's life, brother. I had a brother-in-law who was a drunkard. God saved him and he never was drunk another time and he's in heaven tonight. Don't you make fun of my gospel. This is the true gospel. When God changes a man, he changes you. Now, if you get baptized, then that's all. That's why some of you trying to live a Christian life, you can't. You, you uh, recite the Apostles' Creed, and that's all you have. You have a form of religion. You've never been saved, and you know you haven't, and you try to kid yourself, but you're not prepared to die, and if you had to meet God, you'd have to meet him in fear because you are not saved. Now to call God Father is to be born again. This prayer suggests another proposition is fellowship. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. It's a great prayer to pray for God's will to be done in your life. It may mean that you'll go as a missionary. It may mean that you'll have to sacrifice your life. God's children have died for the gospel's sake. In this model prayer, brother, I could speak and use this as a text for a full month and never exhaust its meaning. This prayer, this model prayer suggests fellowship. Isn't it wonderful to have fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me tell you a joke on myself. I've told it before. This happened one week before I enrolled in a seminary to prepare for the ministry. I was in my hometown some more folks, and they said, let's go to the theater. Back in those days, they didn't have much air conditioning, and the theater people were the only ones that had money enough to air condition their buildings, you know. Well, I felt guilty. Now, don't start laughing. I'm a well-adjusted person. I'm not some kind of a fink. I don't need to be analyzed and dissected. I know what I am. I have a good time. I can laugh, I can cry, I can eat, I can sleep. I don't have to take tranquilizers to go to sleep. I can sit here on this platform and look out across this crowd of hundreds and go to sleep. I don't have any trouble going to sleep. I'm not afraid of work. I can lie down and sleep beside it. <laughs> not much of anything ever bothers me. My wife and fuss at me, and I don't pay any attention. As long as there's a newspaper between us and I've got room to run, but you know, I bought my ticket and I went into that theater. 
Never shall I forget it. The Spirit of God said, John, aren't you going to be a preacher? And I said, yeah, I'm going to try to be. The devil said, John, don't listen. It's cool in here. And man, it was cool. No joking about that. And the Holy Spirit said, suppose some of these fellows you've been trying to win see you in here. I looked around like I was getting ready to rob the First National Bank. The devil said, oh, they won't see you. About that time, I glanced over there and they did see me. I felt so guilty. Sure, it didn't damn my soul. I could, I could go every week like some of you, but I wouldn't have any testimony like some of you either. I won eight people in home visitation last week. Don't sit there and kid me. You've got to have fellowship with God to do that, men and women. Why don't you get out and win some souls? You say you're boasting. No, I'm just telling about what a man who walks with God can do if you walk with God, fellowship with him. You're not going to take him to the theater and have power with him, mind you. You're not going to dabble around in sin and, and set the empty beer bottles on the back porch and then try to throw an apron over them when the preacher comes in. I guess I'm about the snoopiest fellow. Talking about Tyler, they out on South Broadway, they had a big theater there and on a hot Saturday evening, I sometimes would get up there early and park my car to watch my members run and duck. I tell you, that was the most interesting thing you ever saw. Some of you are as guilty as sin. No wonder, no wonder that you're sick spiritually. How can you have fellowship with God and compromise with the world? What, what fellowship hath Christ with Belial? What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? You see, when Pharaoh's crowd tried to get Moses and the Jews to stay down in Egypt, you know what Moses said? He said, not a hoof's gonna be left behind. I'm gonna clear out, lock, stock, and barrel. I'm not gonna leave anything behind. If you want to be miserable, you just dabble around in sin. I referred to it this morning. I'm going to refer to it tonight because it startled me. I remember a young man that made a profession of faith in Christ and was baptized in, the, in what was then the Lachlan Baptist Church, now Landmark Baptist Temple. He broke up his home. He had one of the most beautiful wives that I've ever seen. She was a Christian girl, and I think she wanted to live right. He broke up his home, started running around with another woman, you know what happened? He fell down the stairs and broke his neck. Would to God that had happened to a lot of other fellows, teach you some sense. You know what I believe? God killed him. You say, well, I don't, I, I don't believe in that. Man, you ought to read your Bible. God said about a man who was running around with his stepmother, he said, turn him over to the devil and let the flesh be destroyed that the soul may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And the Bible said because some men had observed the Lord's table unworthily said some are sick and, and a great many are asleep, have died. You tell me that God is not a God of judgment? Now here's where the modernists really will quit me. They say Rawlings preaches God is a God of wrath. Well, why not? He is. The Bible said he's a consuming fire. You think he's going to let his children just do anyway? Reminds me of what a barber. I said, I told this this morning, but since this is on radio, I'll tell it again. This barber friend of mine was telling me the other day having coffee together and he said a woman brought a four-year-old to the barber shop. She finally mastered him and got him in the chair and the barber started around his head right quick and the kid bit him and, and kicked him and jumped out of the chair and ran off and the woman had to take that kid home with just a rim cut around his head, you know. And that little devil was so mean that she couldn't even get him back in the chair. He was demon-possessed. Had a whole flock of them in him, no doubt. Do you think God's going to let one of his children act like that? You're crazy if you think he will. He may let you, he may be patient with you and you get out and sort of get in the briars and the brambles. But if you were a sheep, you're going to have to do one of two things. Either get back to him and say, Father, I've sinned, or else the rod of correction will fall upon you. Now just make up your mind. Going to get you as sure as the world. If you're God's child, I'm not talking to the sinner now. I've done finished talking to him. I'm talking to you as a Christian. You go ahead living in sin. Remember Rawlings told you last Sunday in April 1965 that your sins would find you out. You cannot continue in sin as a Christian get by with it. Now, I, I know a man can't live perfect. I have to clarify the point here. We all ought to try, but we can't live perfectly. But there's one thing we can try. And when you sin deliberately, you see, sin never does come just accidentally. You begin to think about it and you begin to meditate upon it. And the next thing you begin to dabble around in it. 
Take for instance, like some of you fellows, let me show you what I'm talking about. You go ahead in a bar and start ordering a, ordering a uh, soft drink or a cup of coffee and let your buddies drink a beer or a screwdriver, something like that, and see what happens. You want me to tell you? It won't be long until they'll say, oh, come on, John, don't be a sissy, don't be a, don't be a wet blank. Come on, have a drink, and you'll take that beer. And once you slip, son, it's hard to get back. And the lousiest, meanest crowd in the world is backsliders. I'd rather deal with an old red bone sinner than some people in the condition you're in. You're as mean as the devil himself. You, you, you're mean to your family and, and they can't keep you in church. And if you go to church, if anybody even attempts to be friendly with you, why you, you uh, so ill and, and there's nothing good about you as long as you're backslidden. But you let an old backslider come crying to the altar and say, Lord, I'm ashamed. I've sinned, help me, forgive me. And God said in 1 John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And I tell you, you feel like you've been washed pure and white when you get right with God after sinning as a Christian. Amen. Fellowship will be restored. You know what David said? He said, Lord, cleanse me from my sins and then will I teach sinners of your ways and transgressors will be converted unto thee. Now, one other thing. And this prayer suggests lordship. Lordship. You notice sonship and fellowship and lordship. All of this is suggested in this prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Brother and sister, it means something to be able to say this prayer. You know they say it in a lot of Protestant churches and it's nothing in the world but hollow mockery. I think it's blasphemy. It borders on that of being sacrilegious. When men and women stand and pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you cheat as a businessman and you lie to make a few extra dollars and, uh, and live a double life and everything like that. Listen, my friend, that's not praying the will of God be done on earth. No, it isn't. Let me say this to you tonight. If you were to have God's will done in your life in the full content of this text, he'd be Lord of your life. Let me give my own personal testimony. It took me a long time, and I mean this. I had been preaching a while, a good while before Jesus Christ became Lord of my life. I had to first surrender to be a Christian, and then I had to surrender to serve him as a layman. And then I had to surrender to preach the gospel. And I had to forsake a business career and go into the ministry. But brother and sister, that wasn't enough for me. I had to surrender to go to Africa as a missionary before he could be Lord of my life. And then it was a good while before I ever had the fullness of the joy of service. I served God, but it was labor and it was toil. And I'll be frank to tell you that in the later years of my ministry, the ministry of the gospel has become a source of great blessing to me. And as I grow older now, I enjoy it more. You don't let him become Lord of your life just suddenly. It's a, it's a process. It's a, it's a surrender until you come to the place where he really is Lord of your life and where you're willing to let him have all that you have. There was a long time when I didn't, I never, I couldn't pray for God to take my boys and call them into service. And Herb here had to have rheumatic fever and I saw him near death before I'd ever surrender. My other boy, that Harold, that's a preacher that's preaching up close to Chicago today, he almost died and God was breaking my heart. No, I was stubborn and rebellious. Hard for me to give my children back to God I wonder how many of you have let him be Lord of your life and have given your children back to him. Oh, you want them to be business people? You want them to make a million dollars? You want your children to be successful in business? That's all right if God wants them to be. But have you given them back to him? Have you as grandparents given your children back? My oldest grandson is beginning to know right from wrong. He's getting old enough, Herb's boy. God, no doubt, is beginning to speak through him through the word that's taught here. 
and in the prayers of daddy and mother at home. And he was at the house with, his, with another grandson the other night with Bill. And the grandmother had had prayer with him and she said she cut her prayer down short. It wasn't as long as it ordinarily is. But my oldest grandson got up and he said, Phew, that sure was a long one. <laughs> Does your grandchildren see you pray or do they see you participating in sin? How about it? How about it, beloved friends? Have you made the full surrender? This prayer, this model prayer suggests to me that I must become his son through the new birth, through, through something that's more than just Christian education, that I must be born again. This prayer suggests that if I'm to enjoy my Christian life, I'll have to have fellowship with God. And then it suggests the lordship of God over my life, that he must be my all in all, that he must be everything. I'm wondering today how many of you will say of your life, I'm ready now, Lord. I'm ready now for you to take over. I'm ready now for the full and complete surrender. Would you do it? Would you surrender? You know, beloved friends, listen to me. My heart is greatly concerned, not because of the fighting in Vietnam, I am concerned about that. Not because that there are Russian missiles in Cuba, though I am concerned about that. You know what I'm concerned about? Not because of the immorality that's so rampant in America, though I am concerned about that. You know what my chief concern is today? That there's not more young people completely yielding their lives to Jesus Christ and letting him become Lord. Oh, may God in heaven take this audience today, the radio audience and here in this crowd and speak to your heart. Let's bow for prayer and stand quietly, please. I'm going to ask the first question like this. How many of you can call God Father because you've been born again and you know it. Lift your hand. Amen. Thank you. How many of you can say, Preacher Rawlings, I have fellowship with God. And then how many of you can say, He's Lord of my life. Not going to embarrass you. But I want you to ask yourself the question. How about it on those two points? How many tonight in this audience that could not lift your hand as a Christian but you want to be remembered in prayer? There is a longing in your heart to know Christ as Savior. You believe in the Bible. You believe in Jesus Christ. You believe that He died for sinners. And you want to be saved. Lift your hand, will you? Amen. God bless you, young lady. Someone else. Lift your hand tonight, will you? Someone else. Lift your hand. Say, Preacher Rawlings, pray for me. Pray for me. How many tonight in this audience can say, I'm saved and I'm just visiting in the landmark temple. Lift your hand, would you? You're saved and visiting with us. Could I ask our Heavenly Father if it would be His will to let you know whether or not that He wants you to unite with this church? It could be that God's speaking to your heart. You've been greatly concerned about your Christian life and where you can hear the gospel preached, where invitations are given, where there's evangelism, people being saved and baptized. I'm going to pray that God will speak to your heart. Heavenly Father, I pray that sinners tonight will turn away from self and self-righteousness and will turn unto thee. I pray, Heavenly Father, that thou wilt save these precious souls. O oh God, move upon the backslider. And Father, may we have a consciousness of the cost of sin to the Christian. 
Father, I pray that just now you'll speak to hearts. Have your way. Give us a spirit of revival now. Keep your heads bowed. <coughs> Herb and the choir is going to sing. Many of you know tonight that you ought to come and get right with God. Some to be saved and some to rededicate your life. Some to move your membership. Maybe some young man or young lady that God has called into service. Choir is going to sing. Will you pray now while the invitation is being given? Come right on. Come right on. Will you move out now and come? It's invitation time now. Time to come. Come, will you, young man and young woman, father and mother, 